Life comes with a lot of decisions, and it can be hard to know the right path sometimes. A therapist can help you map out what you really want, so you trust yourself to make great choices and feel excited about the future. BetterHelp offers convenient professional online therapy on your schedule, however you want it, by phone, chat, or video call. Let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash positive today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash positive. Being a baseball play-by-play broadcaster demands a blend of learned mechanics, intense preparation, and a calm sense of entertainment. How hard is it to do this job? Let's talk to the ones who do it. This is Matt Spiegel. My new podcast, The PBP, Voices of Baseball, will bring those conversations to you as the best working and former broadcasters tell you why and how they do it. New episodes come every Thursday all summer long. Follow The PBP, Voices of Baseball, on the Odyssey app or wherever you find your podcasts. Jacob Albrocht, Tommy Kester. This is Sports Daily on Wichita's number one sports radio, 97.5 and 1240 KFH. Yeah. Welcome in, everybody, to another week of Sports Daily here on KFH. Glad to be with you. I'm Jacob Albrocht alongside Tommy Castor, Jad Chambers producing for us as we begin the All-Star Week in Major League Baseball. And this really is, as far as games being played, you've got, like, the NBA Summer League, uh, which is interesting, by the way, when Benyama seems to have found a groove. As we make our way through this week, we'll take a peek behind the curtain there at Summer League storylines of interest. Major League Baseball draft in full swing here. We have a very, uh, well, I guess it's a controversial pick for the Kansas City Royals last night. Uh, we'll get into that certainly in depth here. Bob Huggins. Uh, it just gets a little juicier with Bob Huggins at West Virginia. A story that is developing over the weekend that is taking some interesting turns. I don't know how serious it is, but it is certainly something to talk about. The IHOP hotline is open. 869-1240 is that number as always. Uh, We'll have some giveaways, some movie tickets, some wind surge tickets, as well as maybe some others throughout the show today. Glad to be with you here on a Monday. Tommy, how are you? I'm all right. You know that scene from uh, Talladega Nights, Ricky Bobby, when he says, I don't know what to do with my hands. That's kind of how I feel this week with All-Star Week going on. I'm just used to having baseball games on in the background. And so, of course, we've got the Home Run Derby tonight. We've got the All-Star Game tomorrow. But I'm already dreading Wednesday and Thursday because there won't be any games going on. I just like having baseball games on uh, in the background. So I'm. it's always my least favorite week. Uh, just because of that and just because it's really, I mean, it's really a dead week. It's it's hard to find things going on. Yeah, it is. Uh, You know, the Summer League is interesting. It's gotten interesting in recent years because this year it'll be interesting with Wimbenyama for sure. Um, But, you know, we've got Grady Dick out there. He had 10 points, uh, not a particularly great shooting night, but four rebounds, two assists, three steals in his debut. Um, Wimbenyama was fantastic in his second summer league game. So there is stuff out there. Uh, we have a lot, a lot of local flavor, um, on, (laughs) on the NBA summer league that we haven't had. So there is that I'll give us that, but you know, we're sort of counting down the days until TBT. Uh, we're counting down the days until NFL training camp. We do have big 12 media days this week, Tommy, that'll give us plenty to talk about. I'm sure. Uh, And maybe we'll get TJ Cleland, who's out there reporting on that for 12 News for us to pop in if he can and sort of give us a recap of what he's seen over a couple of days there that's broken over two days. But, you know, it is. It's a time to breathe a little bit. It's a time to have some fun. We'll see if we can't get some guests in here as usual this week as well. Uh, Forgive the bags under my eyes if you see them right now. I had a sick kid last night up all night. Um, So that was fun. But, you know, here we go. It is a Monday of the slowest sports week of the year. Happy to be here with you. <laughs> it's, you know, you and I, uh, we, you know, we, we tend to talk before uh, each show and, and figure out what the lineup is going to be and what we're going to be talking about. And I know we get to a week like this and we're both kind of like, well, um, maybe we can find some guests. Let's see what we can do to 
you know, find some interesting topics going on. There's a couple of them today with, with Bob Huggins. You mentioned the Major League Baseball draft first round uh, last night. So there are some good things to, to get into today. But um, I feel you. It's, it's kind of difficult right now. It's speaking of summer league, by the way, Marquise Noel was really good in that game we mentioned for Grady Dick. So that's cool. That's good news. Uh, but we, we will try. We will do our best. Summer league is hard to keep up with. That's the one thing about the summer league, like stats and everything. It is not as readily available as you might imagine that it is. Um, it certainly will be for Wimbenyama. And then for everybody else, they play so many games. It's just, it is kind of yeah. difficult to follow. And can I tell you right now, I don't give a rip about the NBA Summer League. Um, I, I just don't. I mean, I, I, I might take a look at the stat line of the local guys, but I'm not sitting down and locking in and watching NBA Summer you know, League. I feel like I, I there's no break. Like the, the finals just wrapped up and then you go right into the Summer League. I could use a little bit of a breather. It's not that I'm watching it because I'm not, but I'm absolutely following it because the Summer League's been advantageous to our guys in recent years. Like... The Summer League for, and it's not even as much, obviously we follow Grady Dick so closely because he's from Wichita and was a lottery pick, but his place with Toronto is secure in the short term. But for guys like Craig Porter Jr. and Marquise Noel, we've seen Dean Wade earn his way into rosters. Jaime Echenique was a Summer League darling, and now he's working his way through some you know, some NBA sniffs. that. For, for guys around here, there are some meaningful things that happen. Fred Van Vliet, certainly. Rod Baker uh, did well there to earn some, you know, some time. So we'll watch it for you. But when I say watch it, I mean, like, pay attention to it, not like sit down and watch it, watch it. I mean, maybe some of that if you get lucky and you can find a, you know, a Grady Dick game on or something. But we will. We'll, we'll keep you as uh, tuned in to that as we possibly can. Tommy, the first thing, though, today is the Major League Baseball draft. The Royals uh, being poo-pooed on here for their selection of a high school catcher. Apparently, among the baseball nerds, that's not a smart thing to do. And again, for reference's sake, when I say baseball nerds, I mean like analytics, really like deep diving, uh, you know, stats people. History has not been favorable for high school catchers, um, sort of like, you know, high school pitchers in the Major League Baseball draft. That's what the Royals did yesterday. Uh, you know, I, I don't agree with a lot of the narrative that I saw there, but it's I, I don't have that big a problem with it. He's a back to back, you know, player of the year in the state of Texas who is an LSU commit whose offensive numbers jump off the page at you from a high school level. I think a lot of the problem people had is defensively, they don't know if he translates to a big league catcher. But, man, I got to tell you, and I posted this last night, I don't care at this point because if you can't hit, you're not going to get to the big leagues anyway. Like, people want to draw the comparison. MJ Melendez, that's another catcher. They just tried to put it at another position, and it hasn't gone well. MJ Melendez, if he was hitting 320, Tommy, and, hit, you know, decent – nobody would be talking about how bad a defensive outfielder he is. That only amplifies when you can't hit – you know, so if you can hit, you're going to find your way there. And if you're the Royals, I, I don't like defensive, you know, versatile. Like, no, like give me guys that can get to the big league level and hit at the big league level. First and foremost, that's all I care about. But isn't that the big risk is, you know, whether or not he will actually even make it to the big league level? I mean, because keep as in mind. As a catcher, but as a player, that's more key, like. Yeah, I, my biggest issue with it is that I feel like the Royals could have found a safer pick at eight overall. And I understand the thought process of, OK, you go out, you go and find a high school guy who's a phenom in the state of Texas, a Gatorade player of the year back to back. And if you can grab him early, then you can sign him for less. And then you have more opportunities to do more later in the draft. I get that strategy. That's what makes the baseball draft different than basically it's any hard. other draft that we follow. So I, I get that thought, that thought process. That being said, though, the Royals aren't in a position right now to be taking major risks. They're not in a position right now to be able to just go and swing for the fences because they have the luxury of having a deep farm system. They need to have players that they feel extremely confident in that they can develop because of the struggles that the Royals have had in developing players. You would like to try to find, in my opinion, somebody that's a little bit further along in their development that's more of a sure thing to make it to the big leagues. 
my biggest issue with Blake Mitchell as the, the eighth overall pick isn't anything about his talent or his attributes or whatever. It's my fear that the Royals are not going to be able to develop him. And he's raw as a high school player. He hasn't had any college experience. They've got to develop him now and get him ready for the big leagues. And the Royals have a terrible track record in doing that over the last five or six years. So I, 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 I mean, like fundamentally and wholeheartedly uh, disagree with that. So, the the Royals are in the situation that they're in by playing it safe in the draft. They never swung for the fences for the last however many years. Gavin Cross was a safe pick out of West Virginia or Virginia Tech last year. Oh yeah, he's he projects as a nice big league hitter. He's hitting two oh eight this year. Two oh eight in his first year in, you know, professional baseball, really, first full year. It it's like, people act like if you take college players, they translate. Tommy, for years and years. And by the way, we can dog on the Royals' development of players. That's fine. But I'm going to list you some, I'm going to list you four names who were safe, industry wide, considered safe picks in, in Major League Baseball draft, which is why at the time people liked the Royals' rebuild. Now, they haven't done anything with developing these players. But Tommy, Brady Singer, Jackson Coward, Daniel Lynch, Asa Lacey. Those are four college guys, and they're all not going to make it. Maybe one or two of them. If if the, if something you know amazing happens, who's the best player in the Royals system by far is Bobby Witt Jr. Right, a, a high school phenom who can hit the crap out of the ball, and that's like that's it. Like I I, I don't like the Royals. To me, are the exact opposite of the team that needs to play it quote-unquote, safe in the draft. By the way, because absolutely nothing is safe in the Major League Baseball draft. There's not a more difficult uh, thing to do as far as, like, drafting or whatever than trying to draft baseball players. It's why they don't ever come in and play right away because it's such a big, you know, development. And you can you, – there are so many different ways to get there. Uh, Vinny Pascantino, he was – what, he was Old Dominion, right? Like, I think he – I think he played – yeah, he was Old Dominion – and Bobby Wood Jr. was high school. Those are your two best players. But just go look up and down. Like, Gavin Cross hasn't looked good at all. Frank Mazzucato was a high school pitcher that, you know, before this year. This is the first year, by the way, that I've heard you don't, you're don't. you not supposed to take high school pitchers or high school catchers. I haven't, I've never heard that before the Royals made this pick. Mazzucato looks like he's doing okay. He's a high school guy. But their safe picks over the years have been terrible. These well, here's pitchers, my issue. My issue with them going out and getting a high school catcher is there were a couple of very quality college catchers still on the board. And I know it's not necessarily about the position, right? Because you can translate as long as you're a good bat, you can probably translate to another position. Um, but if the, if the Royals are looking for, quote unquote, the heir apparent to Salvador Perez, then there's a guy that was still on the board at number eight overall. Kyle Teal, that was in Wichita two weeks ago and won the Buster Posey Award for the best collegiate catcher in America out of the University of Virginia. And he was projected as a top 10 pick. He was on the board at number eight. He was, I guess you could call it, a safer pick, a more reliable pick. Definitely but he had, a safer pick. But he had a long career at Virginia with a ton of success and I don't think would need as much development in the Royals farm system to be successful at the big league level where a guy like Blake Mitchell is going to have to get used to pro ball. He's going to need the development from the farm system. It's less about, in my opinion, I don't want to knock Blake Mitchell or even just high school yeah, players we in general. Clue. Well, and I'm not, I don't want to knock high school players in general. Uh, what I am knocking is the Royals farm system and the way historically they've approached player development. You listed those guys, Brady Singer, Jackson Kowar, Asa Lacey, Daniel Lynch. I think it, it's, yeah, it's partially, you know, maybe those guys don't have the stuff that we thought they did to translate, but I think also it's a poor job by the Royals yeah. farm system in developing them. And so I have no a doubt. fear. I have a fear of bringing in players that need more development time and, you know, oversight and support to make it to the big league level. I have, I have this big fear that the Royals are going to ruin Blake Mitchell, where I think it would be much more difficult to ruin the pedigree of a guy like Kyle Teal, who's had several years in college ball, maybe is further along in his development. 
I just have this big fear that the Royals are going to ruin this kid. Well, look, that's that's but that's no way to draft. Like if it's between Teal um, and a high school guy, you you just you take the the player that you project to be the better bat. I, Teal fell to fourteen, I believe. By the way, so the Royals weren't the only ones that felt that way. Lots of teams did. Um, I, I just, I it's it's crazy to me to think of safe when you're a franchise that is desperate for great players. Go back even further historically, two of the better first-round draft picks the Royals have ever made, Mike Moustakas and Eric Hosmer, were both high school guys. And, you know, like it's and, – and by the way, Mike Moustakas was a shortstop in high school. Like defensive positions in high school were acting like that's this end-all, be-all. No, I, most, I, I don't. Most no, premier I, talent – my guess is, Tommy, uh, that in, at the high school level – Right, if you took Blake Mitchell, he could probably play anywhere. By the way, he can pitch, um, but he could probably play anywhere. Like the, the, but the reason there was backlash yesterday is because he played high school catcher, and high school catchers don't ever translate that. Like, what a weird way to draft, right? We have this. You're evaluating things. Imagine being in the Royals chair, and you're evaluating this pick, and you're like, man, this guy's bat. Who, by the way. Uh, Danny uh, Ontiveros, who just took over, I believe he just took over this year, director of scouting, or last year, maybe it was last year, says he, you know, he, his his bat at that level reminds him of, you know, Bryce Harper, okay? So imagine being in the chair, the Royals chair, and this is what annoys me about the, the group I call baseball nerds, and, I, and I, I promise I mean that endearingly. I don't mean that negatively, but... You're in that chair. You evaluate this bat that way, right? Like, I, I see this guy, like, his upside is as high as that. His high school bat reminds me of that. That's what he could be. But you know what? We better not take him. He's a high school catcher. We, we better not. We, we love him as much as we love him. I mean, he, he, he could be this transit. We better not take him. He's a high school catcher. And that hasn't, been, you know, over the last 10 years, high school catchers haven't done very well. We better pivot and go do something else. Like, that's, that to me is, like, insane. Like, who cares? If his bat projects that way, you take his bat. I, I don't care what position. He could be a DH. I, I, like, I don't care. Guess what defensive position Shohei Otani plays, Tommy? He's DH. DH. Guess what position kept Vladimir Guerrero an all-star for years and years and years in Major League Baseball? A DH. DH. Nelson Cruz is playing till he's 60 because DH. he's a DH. Like Edgar Martinez is a DH. It doesn't matter what position they play in high school. If they have that kind of bat, you take that kind of bat because they are starved for that ceiling-type player. They have Bobby Witt Jr. at that level, and that's it. Like, they don't have guys. Like, everyone's excited about, you know, Michael Garcia. That's great. But he's projecting to maybe be like an everyday big league player. And we're excited about that because they don't have very many of those guys. I get it. But you've got to swing for the fences. When you're this bad, that's not the time to play it safe. That's the time to – got to turn this thing around – and shoot big here, and we better be great in the international game, or we'll never get it turned mm -hmm. around. But if we're going to ever break out of this cycle, the last five or six years of safe picks has been terrible. So let's not do that anymore. Let's try swinging for the fences and see what happens. I remember when the Royals drafted Asa Lacy a couple of years ago, and the comparisons were off the chart. And I remember hearing yeah. from the Royals' front office about how you know, he, I don't even remember the guys that he was being compared to, but it was like all star, you know, legends, Hall of Famers, all of that. And it, it has not, has not turned into that at all. Uh, and it's not going to for Asa Lacey. So if, uh, and he was you know, as if, safe and, a pick, by the way, like as if by, if by Blake, across the board, if Blake Mitchell is compared to Bryce Harper, I mean, that's, that's tough. That's that not is what a I'm tough saying. Comparison. And I'm so I want to, I, I better be. see, like, I, if they're going to take that big of a swing on him, then you better see him in the big leagues hitting like Bryce Harper at some point. If that's, that's not the what comparison I'm saying. What I'm saying drawn. is if that's how you evaluate that player, like if you think his tools, right, are at that level, yeah. 
you take that pit. You don't not take it because he played catcher in high school. Tommy, here's here's what I will guarantee you. If if Blake Mitchell, who's high school again, two time player of the year and and as good a baseball state as there is. If he plays center field or shortstop, which I'm quite certain he could do, everybody would be all over this pick. Oh my God, look at that bat. He plays a premier defense. Look, look at the, oh man, he, he, he's he got such a great bat. He's committed to LSU two times. Like if that was the case, if there was an SS or an OF in front of his name and he's the exact same player, this, what we're doing right now and what we saw all over social media last night does not happen. That's how absurd this is to me. Like, the fact that he played catcher in high school is why people don't want the Royals to take him. Don't want the Royals to take him all you want. That's fine because you don't think he's the kind of player. But don't not want to take him because he played catcher in high school. Who cares? I do think, though, that, you know, and I know that you, you know, sort of made fun of this a little bit ago. But I do think that there is something to be said for precedent around the league a little bit. I mean, I think sure. you have to no, you have to at least consider that. And and I know the stat that you're referencing is the one I sent you last night in the last 10 years. There were 14 catchers that were in high school that were drafted in the first round. Only five of them have made the big leagues in the last 10 years. 14 college catchers drafted in the first round. 12 of them have made the big leagues. So the, the stats and the precedent over the last 10 years that show is right there. And I know everybody's different and evaluating players is different and all of that stuff. But the, the more likely path to have a big league catcher being drafted in the first round, that kid comes from college. I, I wonder if that stat, and I don't, there's no way I'll ever find this because I would be willing to bet that that stat is different for guys who played catcher in high school, but didn't make it to the big leagues as catchers, right? Like, didn't make it to the big leagues, period, or just didn't make it to the big leagues as a catcher. And I don't know. I, mean, I don't just even re- know yeah, how to just, look. That I think up. just reach the big leagues because some of these guys, at least a couple of them on the list, no longer play catcher. Like in the fourteen college catchers that twelve reached the big leagues. One of them is Kyle Schwarber, who no longer plays catcher. So I think it's he just was made the, the big leagues in general. He was the comp, by the way, that I kept seeing. Oh, if he's Kyle Schwarber, Kyle Schwarber's so terrible in the outfield, and I'm just like, if Kyle Schwarber's bat. Was it, you know, eight in this draft? You take Kyle Schwarber's bat 10 times out of 10. Like, why is that a bad thing? Again, there's a DH now. And I, if he's a bad right fielder but can hit 40 home runs a year, I'll be okay with that. And I don't care what the nerd numbers say on that. Like, yeah, okay, maybe he's not a good defensive above replacement outfielder in the corner of right. Like, I don't care. Can you hit? Because the Royals don't have anybody that can. Let's switch gears a little bit. We'll go to the IHOP hotline before we take a break, and we'll continue the conversation. Mike wants to talk All-Star Game. What's up, Mike? Hey, guys. Hey, it's cool to be on the air. Do you guys think the All-Star Game should be played at the end of each MLB season, not in the middle of each season? Because that way, players who played the best for you know a whole season would make it to the All-Star Game. To me, having the All-Star Game in the middle of each season is sort of like having an auto race and naming a guy the racer of the day when there's still 35 laps to go. What do you guys think? Thanks, guys. Uh, I appreciate it. I I think it's odd sometimes that we give away MVPs before we've seen the postseason. Um, You know, I I, I think I I probably would, I would stick with the middle of the season. One, it's a needed break for the sport in such a long season. You don't have to worry as much about guys being ready to shut it down. I think you'd have a really hard time finding pitchers at the end of a season the all-star game, at least now you can just bring, you know, you can bring in pitchers for an inning or whatever. I don't know how you do that at the end of the season in baseball. I think it'd be too hard. Yeah. I don't really care one way or another. I mean, especially right. now that, especially now that there's no home field advantage attached to the all-star game, it's irrelevant to me. I mean, I get the the spectacle of it. I don't really care one way or another. The all-star break, I think is a thing that matters because it's in the middle of the season. I think if you put it at the end of the season, it would be far more akin to the Pro Bowl, which literally nobody cares about. At least with the NBA All-Star Game and you know Major League Baseball All-Star Game, you at least have interest because the season is still continuing. So, no, I, I like it mid-season. Thanks for the call, Mike. Uh, 869-1240, the IHOP hotline is open. We're going to continue this conversation 
Uh, this has been fascinating to me to see the play. And, and I, I should have put this out there before, like total disclaimer here. I don't know anything about any of these players in the Major League Baseball draft, except the two LSU guys. Like, that's pretty much it. I, I don't, like, nada, nothing. I never heard, Tommy, of Blake Mitchell until last night at the draft. And I would venture to guess that most people that are outraged about the Blake Mitchell pick fall into that same category. I don't think anybody. And by the way. That's okay. I don't think. That's it, all right. I don't think anybody saw Teal play either. I think we know who he is because he came to Wichita. But, like, I can't sit here and compare Teal to Blake Mitchell. I don't know anything about either one of them. But philosophically is where I've had a little bit of an issue. But we'll we'll continue here on this conversation. It's an interesting one, certainly, uh, mostly because the Royals stink, and that's unfortunate. 869-1240. We'll come back. More Sports Daily right after this. All right, welcome back, everybody. Sports Daily on KFH. It's all Brockton and Caster. Glad to be here with you. We're talking about uh, the Royals and the draft yesterday. Uh, they make a pick. Uh, you know, Blake Mitchell. I didn't know anything about Blake Mitchell before they took him. People are not happy that they took a high school catcher because that's not a great place to draft historically. But again, my contention is all I care about is, you know, can the guy hit? Because right now, there's not a lot in the system that can. And I, I I, also fundamentally agree with, like, they needed to play it safe. Saw the comparison that they needed a single or a double, and they swung for the fences. Man, I'd, I'd be swinging for the fences, too, if I had nothing in the system. If, by the way, a safe pick, you take those because they're supposed to help you quickly, right, in the next two or three years— they're going to suck in two or three years, no matter what they do. So I'd rather them be real good in five years than, you know, 70 wins in three years. So I, I don't know. I guess I just don't get it. And and again, I don't scout these players. If you, don't, if you don't like the player, like if you don't like Blake Mitchell, that's fine. Like I've got no issue with that. I don't know anything about that. I'm just talking philosophy here. If the guy projects, and again, Danny Onaveros, you know, projected him as a reminder, right, player comps are always totally unfair and ridiculous, but just, like, as a comp, as a, you know, whatever, stylistic, it was a Bryce Harper type thing. And, I, you know, I've heard Kyle Schwarber, we mentioned, be brought up as a negative reason not to do this if that's that kind of bat. And I disagree with that. Take the bat. Take the bat that can, you know, that can produce at the big league level. you got to bake in a little bit of, you know, defensive development, if not at catcher, then any, literally anywhere else. Because, again, I don't care. You know, turn him into a second baseman. Turn him into a right fielder. Get him into the minor league. See if he can catch. If it doesn't look like he's going to project as a catcher, okay, fine. Put him somewhere else. Let him learn how to do that. He's going to be 18. He's got plenty of time to fit into whatever window the Royals are trying to, you know, deal with now. But, Tommy, the biggest reason why I laugh at this idea that they should be taking college players is because they've had terrible recent history taking college players. Terrible. Last year, Gavin Cross. Asa Lacey, Daniel Lynch, Jackson Coar, Brady Singer. No, 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 no. Like, none of them have panned out. And, again, they, and you want them to keep... The, again, that's got to be, I think, less on the players and more on the system being terrible. I think it's, it's both. It's a combination it's both. of both, right? It's a combination of both, to be fair. But the, the Royals farm system and their development they've done these young players no favors whatsoever one thing that I want to make a a point on real quick is that I think that we can differentiate a little bit here like these two things don't have to be mutually exclusive you can be safe and you can swing for the fences at the same time and I don't think you can necessarily correlate like safe automatically means college and swing for the fences automatically means high school. Those two things don't necessarily always play into, into place. So by saying a, you know, the Royals making a safe pick at number eight overall, that doesn't necessarily mean that you pick a, a boring player or somebody that, you know, might project to be a, a decent. No, I think you can still swing for the fences at number eight, but maybe with somebody that's more proven. So I think that the word proven 
is a little bit better than the word safe. That's kind of what I'm looking for because safe has negative connotations to it. I'd rather the Royals at eight overall take a player, and maybe it is swinging for the fences that projects really, really highly, but somebody that is a little bit more proven than a high school player. That's my only point. I, I just, they've done that though, and it hasn't worked out. So using that model just because it is that model doesn't make sense to me for the Royals organization. They've had, you know, they've had a decent history of doing both. Now their recent history of first round picks has not been good really. And I mean, it's been Bobby Witt Jr. is the exception of course, to all of that, but Bobby Witt Jr. is a transcendent talent. You happen to pick number two, right? So that's not, that, that doesn't take like a, a genius to figure out at that point because Bobby Wood Jr. was that kind of a prospect. Um, I just like when you look at their history, there haven't been a ton of amazing for, but but that goes across baseball, by the way, too. Like it's not just the Royals that struggle with first round picks. It's literally everybody. And so you have to get it right in the international game. You have to get it right in player development, which is what they haven't gotten right. That's, to me, a far bigger you know, need, and everything is development versus drafting. But, I, I, again, like you, it all comes down to the way you project players. If you project this guy, this wasn't some absurd pick. There was, it was the no, pandemic it's, it's year. Not. It was the pandemic year. And the Rangers drafted a player that wasn't on anybody's like top 150 list. That's absurd, right? Blake Nelson. Is that his name? Blake Mitchell. Blake Sorry. Mitchell. Blake, Mi- Blake, Blake Mitchell. Mitchell is, from what I can tell, no no worse than a top 15 player on everybody's projection lists here. So they took him, what, seven spots before, you know, his projections? Like, it wasn't some insane reach that they made i'm telling you tommy because i see it across it all the time when people get so caught up in stats and we do this in baseball more than any other sport it's because there's a c in front of his name that people are mad right now no if there was i don't any think other that's letter in front i don't of think his that's name, only it that's not why i'm upset about it i i it has nothing to do with him being a catcher it has to do with them being a high schooler. Like that that's that's ultimately what it but comes down to. But they've taken all these college guys forever and they they aren't working out. Bobby Wood Jr was a high school guy. I I totally understand what you're saying and I get it. I don't think that there if if there wasn't a guy and I know that I the you're completely right in the last segment when you say that the only reason I know Kyle Teal is because he won that award here in Wichita a couple of weeks ago. But if if he wasn't still on the board as the best collegiate catcher in America at number eight, projected inside the top ten, I think he went thirteen to the Red Sox. 14. But the best the best college catcher in America still on the board, and maybe Blake Mitchell projects out to be a better player in general, not even catcher, but a, a better player in general than Kyle Teal does. Maybe that's the case in five, seven, ten years, and we can revisit this conversation then. But right now, again, I don't want to use the word the Royals needed a safe pick, quote unquote. I don't want to use the word safe because that's a bad word. It's a bad connotation. I would have rather seen them get somebody more proven. Now, if Blake Mitchell comes in and the Royals are magically able to develop him when they haven't been able to develop anybody hardly in their system at all over the last five or six years, then I'll eat my words on that. But right now, he look he's raw. He may have to play another position. He may have a great bat that projects to be like Bryce Harper. Time will tell on that. I have no idea if he can hit home runs like Bryce Harper or whatever. He's a lefty with power. But at the end of the day, I think the biggest thing for me is what is the likelihood of an eighth overall pick not only making it to the big leagues, but having an impact on this Royals organization in a couple of years. And He's a two-way I, prospect, by the way. And I feel, by the way, and just one final point on this, I feel like there is a much better chance. You know what? Let let me take that back. I don't even want to say a much better chance. There is a better chance for a guy that was the best college catcher in America to break it into the big leagues and make an impact at at the big, at the big league level. Oh, there's a guy like Blake Mitchell. There's no question about that. I don't disagree with that at all, but I'm not interested in just 
breaking into the big leagues. I'm interested in trying to find players like all-star caliber players. There is a way better chance Teal makes it to the big leagues than this high schooler. Like, there, that's not even debatable. But I, but when I'm as bad as the Royals are, that's not the only thing you know that matters to me. We've got to have like real high ceiling, high caliber players for the Royals, or nothing will change for them. He's a two way prospect, by the way. Hits from the left side, and he's going to the best baseball program in the country. So again, I I, I want to just like evaluate it as if he didn't have a C in front of his name because it's not because of him catching that even has him on these radars anyway it's his bat that has him on these radars it's not it's not his defensive position to me you know this is sort of like the royals are at a casino in vegas and they've been at the same blackjack table for a number of years and they keep losing hand after hand after hand they don't have a whole lot of money left rather than trying to build it back up they're just pushing all their chips into the center and I think it's risky, and I think the Royals have to be as risk-averse right now as they possibly can be. Maybe Blake Mitchell is the guy, but, man, it sure seemed like a desperate pick to me at number eight. Frank Mazzucato in recent years is, and Bobby Witt Jr. are the only two high schoolers they've taken. Mazzucato is, I mean, the jury's way out because he's still so young, but he's been handling himself pretty well in A-ball. He just got a promotion and has only pitched like once. But... When you so so just in recent history, right? If those are your two high schoolers and your college players are Prado, Singer, Cower, Lynch, or, sorry, Coar, Lynch, Lacey, and Gavin Cross, I I just you know like it it doesn't it doesn't matter in baseball. Like the way you get there in baseball is so different. It's not like other sports. In the NFL, the vast majority of pro bowlers and great players are first round picks, right? NBA, same thing. In baseball, no. Throw it out the window. Like it you you just have to and again, this has been the Royals' bigger issue is they have not developed or projected right. But if you gotta you gotta go with who you just just who you think the best bat is. You can't worry about you know, oh man, are they going to be able to? Because they're not—they're not in that sort of position. They have to swing for the fences. That part of it, philosophically, I haven't agreed with. Speaking of baseball, let's give away some wind surge tickets real quick. Uh, you can go see the wind surge on us. Four pack of vouchers available to you here. Cool thing about those vouchers is you can pick the game you go to see. They're good for any of them. Uh, courtesy of Sports Daily and KFH, Jad will get us a winner. First caller, four pack of wind surge tickets. Eight six nine twelve forty. Right now to the IOP hotline. We'll come back. More Sports Daily right after this. All right, welcome back. Congratulations to Jamie to go see the surge, courtesy of us Sports Daily here. Glad to be able to do that for you. We'll have some more giveaways throughout the show here. We'll give lots of stuff away, in fact, this week as we make our way through to the All-Star Game. Bob Huggins conversation coming up uh, in the next hour. Uh, Maybe a little summer league. We'll finish with Major League Baseball. The rest of the draft, Tommy. I, I love the baseball draft. I really do. But it's the one where, like, Man, I don't know anything about the players. And I, I used to be able to know a little bit more about the college players because I would religiously watch the Carl's World Series, but it's never been great. But I still enjoy the draft quite a bit and seeing if any of these you know prospects make it all the way through because I, I love you know prospects and minor league baseball. And I do still keep up with all of that stuff once they you know sort of get to where they're going. Uh, top of the draft, pretty... You know, universally, I'll say this, too. Like, this was considered a very strong draft, and they're not always considered that way. But the top five, everybody sort of knew the the top five. I think there was a pretty clear tier that is the top five. They went maybe not in the order people thought. Uh, but you had the Pirates buck a trend and take a pitcher number one overall. That rarely happens. But there was a guy, again, when you, com- you, know, the, when you look at people's projections – like outside of, you know, Steven Strasburg and maybe like Mark Pryor, if you're talking about, you know, guys that, you know, that project as highly as he does coming out, that's where he is at this point in uh, in his development, Paul Skeen. So I, I you know, was good for the Pirates for taking a shot there because teams like the yeah. Pirates don't get a chance to take 
top line pitchers. I mean, they had pretty good luck with Garrett Cole. So yeah, go I think it, it was, um, and I don't know exactly. It might have been the LSU coach, wasn't he on ESPN doing analysis last night? Jay Johnson, I think he was there, and uh, he mentioned that. And I know that obviously he's this kid's coach, but you know he mentioned that uh, you know there there were some other players that were projected, you know, in the top five that could be really good big league players, maybe even all stars. But when he when he talked about Skeens, he said that this guy they could build a statue for him outside of uh, of the stadium in Pittsburgh. So um, I, I've I've heard comps to like Max Scherzer, Justin Verlander on the table. That's always a dangerous game, kind of like when you're projecting sure. Blake Mitchell. You know, kind of being like yeah. Bryce Harper. Like that's really it's dangerous to do. It's com- it's comps. It's yeah. But and, and I think all they do at that point is and not not Verlander or Scherzer because I don't think those guys coming out were as highly you know graded out as those other guys we mentioned those are more like it you know if things go well it could be that type of pitcher but that's all you can do right is how did they scout like do they scout and I think that's what people are pulling from when they say Strasburg and Pryor and whatever is that he scouts that way Dylan Cruz who everyone thought would be the number one pick uh, goes number two to the Nationals um, he's as safe and as highly, you know, skilled a bat at the top of the draft, I, I believe, since Adley Rutschman is what I saw. Um, and then Max Clark, Wyatt Langford, Walker Jenkins, all in whatever order the next three of those guys. What did you think, real quick, Tommy, about the lottery being involved here? Um, some teams, you know, that I like really that. helped. Some, it really hurt. I like it. I think it's the, I do too. It's the way that, you know, a lot of these drafts are, are moving towards, like in the NBA and all that. They're in that world. And I don't have a problem with it at all. I think it adds an added level of intrigue. One final thought on Blake Mitchell. Here's a question for you. Do you know who the last high school catcher was that was drafted as high as Blake Mitchell was in the draft? Uh, Joe Maurer? Nope. You got to go back to 2008. A guy by the name of Kyle Skipworth. Did Kyle ever make the majors? I remember. He did not. Name. Again, I don't care that he plays catcher. I want to know if his bat translates. The catcher part of it is the least important part of that draft pick. I just want to know, can his bat translate? That's it. Don't care about catcher. What kind of hitter is he? He wasn't drafted because he's a catcher. He was drafted because he's a hitter. I, I'm pretty sure. I, I don't think they're, you know, I don't think they're looking at his defensive abilities as a reason to reach on him. They're doing it because his bat projects that way. Two-time player of the year going to LSU. He can hit. I, I don't know. I, obviously, uh, a risky pick by the Royals for whatever you know account. But they're all risky. They're all risky. There's not a risk. There's not a not risky pick uh, in this draft. That maybe maybe Cruz out of LSU isn't risky. Everybody else is risky. Eight six nine twelve forty is the IHOP hotline. We can jump back into the draft, Royals fans, if you'd like. If you want to go back to the conversation, you can always find it for free on the Odyssey app. We'll come back. Bob Huggins. What in the world? We'll hit it next on Sports Daily.